So, Namaskar and good morning to all of you. <clears throat> I'd like to start with a, <clears throat> an old Sanskrit sloka which is chanted before the start of anything auspicious and good. Uh, many of our Indian brothers and sisters must have heard of this very often. You might have heard it. But unfortunately today, few people know Sanskrit, so they, they don't know what they are saying. You know? Uh, the other day somebody came to me and said he can't find a job. I said, why? He said, because I'm a Sanskrit Pandit. That's the situation. So many, especially the young, may not know what it means because we hear it very often. It's part of the culture, but we don't realize what we are saying. So let me say it first and then explain what it is. I think it's apt when we are sitting in a place which is called the Institute of Management. I'm deliberately avoiding the Indian Institute of Management. Well, an institute of management is an institution of management, whether in India or anywhere else. Anyway, I am. This is <clears throat> between the teacher and the taught, the student and the teacher, how they should sit together and listen to what's going on and then start off from there. The sloka is, Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavaditamastu Ma Vidvishavahai. Om Shanti, 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 everybody knows. Peace, peace, peace. So, if you note the first three slokas, Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavava. What is the first word that comes? Saha. Saha. Saha means both of us. It's not meant only for the teacher, nor meant only for the student. It is that may both of us understand each other. Because the moment a teacher thinks that he knows everything, he has ceased to be a teacher. The teacher is one who is all the time a student, who learns. If you learn, and if you are a teacher who learns constantly, then your students also learn how to learn constantly. Anyway, that is a different matter. This is not a Vedantic discussion. So, Saha means two of you. You can't say Saha when there is only one. So, it None of the important things in life are monologues. They are always dialogues. So the daya is saha. May you and I, sahana avavatu, may you and I be nourished, I'm sorry, protected. Why protected? Protected from distraction so that we can listen to what's going on. Protected physically from lightning and rain and things like that. This was especially relevant when students sat in the forest academies with generally teamed with scorpions and snakes. May we both be protected, the teacher and the student. The next, Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu. May both of us be nourished. You know that without nourishment, if you don't eat for 10 days, you cannot even think. Nourishment is an essential part of any learning process. So first, physical nourishment and second, spiritual nourishment. So that you get, what do you say when you are thinking about something very seriously? You say food for thought, right? So thought also requires some food. So, Sahana Bhunaktu, may both of us be nourished enough to understand whatever we are trying to do. Sahaviryam Karavavahai, may the virya, 
the virility in both of us, the energy in both of us increase. Tejas Vinavadi Tamastu. May the Tejas, the spiritual uh, radiance, increase in you and I. Not only for me. Makes no sense if only my spiritual radiance goes up. What about you? Tejas Vinavadi Tamastu. Ma Vidvishavahai. Now, this is very important. Let's not fight or quarrel with each other. Because a dialogue is different from an argument. In an argument, it's a, it almost like a quarrel because I am saying something, I think I am right. You say something, you think you are right. We can't meet. It's different from a discussion. What is a discussion? A discussion is where I and you sit down together on a bench on a beautiful evening in a nice park. Your IIM looks like a good park anyway. And then examine the problem together, you and I. Not saying that, oh, I know everything. And you say, hey, don't talk. I know all this stuff. When both of us together sit and look at anything, a problem, an opinion, a point, then it becomes, it fulfills the meaning of this prayer. Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, and so on. So we will start with that. I don't know what you expect me to say. Because, um, firstly I see a lot of young students here. And I see a cross-section, people from different states in India and different countries of the world. So, I'm kind of still trying to figure out how I, how I should address this gathering. Uh, let me start with something, with a little story, which is my favorite story. I've been repeating it on and on. Those who have been listening to me for many days, for many years, please bear with me. But some things need repetition before they actually go in, you know. Because listening to something is not such an easy thing to do. You can hear, but you may not listen. Suppose you are sitting here, the words are falling in your hearing apparatus. But if, unless your attention is here, you are not listening. Right? So, listening is so important. So, I think it bears repetition again and again. Some of you may be hearing it for the first time, which is good. It's nice to hear it for the first time. Imagine, in a country like India, it's not an uncommon sight. Under a huge banyan tree, somewhere in the countryside, you see somebody sitting. A man in wear torn robes, very old clothing, which is torn everywhere, stitched by hand here and there, and looks like it was once upon a time white, but it has now turned brown, the cloth the clothes which he wears. He looks somewhat like a madman. He's not shaved, his, his hair is unruly. And he sits under the banyan tree with a begging bowl in his hand. Nowadays very few people even know what's a begging bowl. Indication that you don't know where your next meal is coming from. A begging bowl in his hand. But then, look at the expression on his face. It's a joyous expression on his face. As if he's enjoying an internal ecstasy. Absolutely joyous. Perhaps not saying a word, just sitting there. 
That's the first part of the story. The second part is, and to see him, to take his blessings, to f- wish that he would look at you. There is a long line of people come to meet him. What kind of people? Generally, modern India, go look at the parking lot. There are Mercs, there are BMWs, there are Rolls Royces for good measure, a few. And there are Land Rovers and there are all other things down below. All this in the parking lot. This whole group has come to see this man who doesn't know where his next meal is coming from, who is wearing torn clothes with an ecstatic smile on his face, looks like a madman. Why have these people come? To get what from him? Who doesn't have anything? From outward circumstances, you would think he has nothing. So what have people come to take from him? Two things are evident. One is, even having all these things, they're not happy. And this man, who has none of these things, is happy. So, what have they come for? Hoping that they would partake of a little bit of peace and happiness from him. Of course, in India the case is not so easy, it's not so direct. Many people would come and say, well, I have only two BMWs, I want a third one, please bless me and so on. But at least there is one section of people who have come, all of them, that they would partake of a little bit of peace from this mad-looking man who has nothing. So two things are evident. With all this, there is no peace. And with nothing, there can be peace. And if this peace is in this man, this peace and tranquility and blissful ecstasy is in this man's heart. Since all of us are human beings, it's evident that it should also be in us, be in us even though we don't know where it is or how to find it. This is the situation. Now, there was a great a weaver saint in Banaras, in India, whose name was Kabir Das. Some of you must have heard of him. He was not a lazy man who decided that religion is the best thing to happen. He was a man who earned his living by weaving cloth every day. He was a weaver. And he has sung beautiful songs. They are called the Sant Bani, or the Dohes of Kavi. In one of them, referring to the same thing, he talks about a, a kind of deer, D-E-E-R deer, not D-E-A-R, D-E-E-R deer that lives in the Himalayas, which is called the Kasturi deer, the musk deer. You all know what is musk. It's always there in most of the perfumes you find musk. I don't know if you are aware that this perfume, the musk, actually comes from a gland in a Himalayan deer. <clears throat> Kabir says that this deer, it has a little pouch somewhere under its tail or abdomen or somewhere which in a certain season produces musk. In India, musk is called kasturi. So it's called a kasturi mrga, the musk deer. And when in this season the musk forms, there's a beautiful fragrance that spreads in the air. Lovely fragrance. And the poor deer, you can also say D-E-A-R here, The poor deer, not knowing the source from where the smell of musk is coming from, the fragrance of musk is coming from, goes all around the forest looking for it. 
puts its snout into thorns and bushes and gets bleeding. But it doesn't know that the source of this mask, this kasturi, is actually in a little pouch under its tail, under its abdomen. Kabir said, this is the case of the human being who searches for happiness everywhere, not knowing that it's right inside him or her. Now, this is the whole theory and practice of yoga as well as Vedanta. In fact, yoga has several interpretations. Many people now know yoga, but they know only Hollywood yoga, which means to keep yourself physically fit, which is fine, of course. You should keep yourself physically fit, there's no question. But yoga is much more than that. The asanas or the postures that one performs are just one part of yoga. But then people, even in India, don't think about it. So why do we think about Hollywood? I mean, we don't blame anybody. Once in Wisconsin, I went to a yoga class. So They're all very good yoga practitioners. So I said, what yoga do you practice? They said, we do Ashtang Yoga. I said, great. Nice word, Ashtang Yoga. So I asked them, do you know who is the founder of Ashtanga Yoga? They said, of course we know. Who is the founder? They said, BKS Iyengar. You know? Ashtang Yoga was founded many hundreds of thousands of years ago by a great sage called Patanjali. And the asanas that you do are just one of the eight sections of yoga, which are called Ashtanga, eight sections. Yoga of eight parts. So, the yogi, the Vedantin, the Bhakta, all these seekers after truth, everybody searches for this kasturi, the mask, which is in us and looking for which we go all over the world. Now we have a basic question. What does every human being want? Nobody wants Kasturi, I agree, okay. So what does every human being want? In this world, what is it that every sane human being seeks? Let's forget about religion, philosophy. Practically, what do we look for? What are we looking for? Happiness, peace, tranquility. If that is not there, does anything else matter? Tell me. You can have everything, but if there is no peace in you, or no peace at home, what does it matter? So, happiness is what every living being searches for. There is nobody who doesn't, unless we are not okay here. Sometimes I think it's better that you're not okay here. The civilization that we have is thousands of years of perfect sanity. I wish somebody went mad. Maybe things would have been different. Anyway, so here we are. The happiness that we seek. And do we come across it? We think we do. But then the very fact that the next Ten days later we are looking for something else, means that we have not finally come to it. I think, well, if I have this, 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 I'll be happy. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy for a short while. Then I say, no, 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 I need that also to be happy. Okay? I work very hard, I acquire it then. <sighs> not satisfied, I have to move forward. It goes on and on. It doesn't stop. And by the time we think it has stopped, we are not there. We are out of the scene. Is there anybody who lives forever? I know it's not a good subject for young people, but please remember that nobody lives forever. And by the time you have worked out all your things, it's time to go. And then death, you know why we are afraid of death? We are not afraid of death so much because it is unknown, but because when we die, we cannot take all the things that we want with us. 
if somebody said to me, death is very near you, tomorrow you are going to die. Oh my God. Okay, now what? But you can take your house, you can take your wife, you can take your lover, you can take everything with you when you die. Who is afraid of death? The very fear of death is that you have to leave everything that you think which is dear to us, including your favorite cup of coffee in the morning. Sitting in beautiful surroundings. That's the fear. But then everybody comes to that. And when we were looking for peace and happiness, finally they put a little placard there saying, rest in peace, R.I.P. It's a beautiful statement, that means that's the only time you're resting in peace, probably. My guru, Babaji, used to say that R.I.P. doesn't really mean rest in peace. It means rise if possible. Nobody has risen yet, so, yeah, so this is, I'm not, please don't think I'm painting a very desolate picture of life, I'm not, I'm just showing you the truth, the facts of life. So therefore, Kabir Das said, this joy and happiness that we seek is natural, everybody seeks for it. But you are seeking it in the wrong direction. Said so instead of seeking it outside, if you can turn around and seek it within you, you probably would find the fountain of happiness, which when we experience in little bits, we think is coming from outside. Actually it's coming from me. I am the one who is experiencing happiness. When I eat an ice cream, the happiness is not in the ice cream, it is in my enjoying it. The Vedantic theory is that every time somebody enjoys something in life, a little bit of that internal enjoyment is manifest. So we think we are enjoying because of it. I'll give you another example. I think I will be very happy if I uh, own a BMW, let's say. Young people do that in the West. What do you do after your first salary? I'm trying to get a BMW. Good. Nice car, fine. But then I think I'm going to be happy. Yes, and I am happy. Once I get the BMW, I touch it. Oh, beautiful. And then I wash it every day and keep it clean and sparkling. I drive it out. Oh, it's smooth driving. It's even more better because my girlfriend is on the left side. Great. Wonderful. Beautiful. Okay. Now I see, ah, I'm very happy. Until I have to pay insurance or, or my girlfriend goes so the seat is empty. Or, I mean, anything can happen. Or I go and graze somewhere and it's, I have to pay so much to patch it up and so on and so forth. Or it gets old and then starts making grrr sounds. But then when I got it, I was happy. Do you know why one is happy when you get what you desire? Because at that point, the mind has stopped longing for anything. It's not because of the BMW, it's because there is no more longing at that moment. There is no grasping, there is no desire to catch it. The mind is at rest, therefore one is happy. The moment it goes and something else comes, again the whole process starts. So we often mistake this happiness and say it is because I have acquired something, it's because the mind has ceased to be agitated for the moment. And we are saying, is this possible to keep the mind from being agitated at all times? No matter what we have or what we don't have. I'm not telling you not to get BMWs, please. Even I enjoy driving one, that's okay. I don't have one, but whoever has it. So, the, what you need to understand from this is that happiness is a state of mind. It's not dependent on what you have, what you don't have. When you find happiness, it means for some time you have attained what you think you like 
and you are enjoying it and the mind is not agitated. It will begin agitated again because you will want then to buy something else. This is a constant process that goes on in the mind. Right? So, we are saying that apart from the world that we see outside, there are other dimensions. There are greater horizons for the mind to expand. We are limited to the world which is only visible to us through our five sense organs. How do we know what the world is? Only through our sense organs. And how many sense organs do we have? How many? Five. What are they? Sight, one sense organ. Hear, another sense organ, hearing. Taste, smell and touch. So all our experiences are based only on these five organs that we possess. Every human being has this. Right? Now, when I say I have formed my own rational framework in my life based on my experiences and I am not going to move out of this little thing which I have formed. This simply means, you know, when I was a child, I had my own rational framework depending on my experiences. When I grew up and went to college from school, it changed. I have a different framework which I call my logical rational framework. And then, in my teens, I thought, this is what is absolute truth because I have learned it. And this is my experience and this is the truth. Until you got married and everything shook. I mean, I'm not saying it happens to everybody. But then you have a different framework then. Right? You have then, based on your experiences as a married man or woman, created another framework. It goes on and on till you change, you become old, you have children, then you die. So when you die, there is no framework anyway. So till that point, our so-called rational framework or blueprint keeps shifting. Why? Based on our experiences. And all the experiences we have are dependent on the five organs of perception. From the inputs or the data that we get from the five organs of sensation, the mind manufactures its own rational framework. It can change according to the inputs. But the inputs are limited only to the five senses. We don't have any other instruments of perception. There is no other instrument of perception. Well, not entirely right. The yogis say, the Rishi said, the mystics said, that there are other organs of perception. Now these organs of perception, you don't see it anywhere, so where is this organ of perception? Hmm? The yogis say that in the human being, in the human form, in the human system, there are other organs of perception which have not been activated in most people, but they are there in potential form. When these could be activated through various techniques and various methods of living, then you get an additional organ of perception or several additional organs of perception where your inputs increase. Your inputs become multidimensional. Not just three dimensions. We live in a three dimensional world. Right? Multi dimensional. So, when you have multi dimensional data, when you have multi dimensional inputs, your framework of rationalism also becomes multi pointed and multi dimensional. You are no longer limited to be as man who or a human being dependent only on your sense perceptions but from something that can get you experiences outside your sense perceptions. Extrasensory. Now the whole process of spiritual life or the practice of yoga or the mystic life 
is awakening these centers of perception other than the five that we possess. Now if you think it is imagination, I want to say something. Fifty, sixty years ago, you know the brain is such a sensitive little organ. All that happens, happens from here. Sixty years ago, a very small ductless gland belonging to the endocrinal system which is embedded in midbrain, inside the middle of the brain, called the pineal gland, was 60 years ago considered to be a vestige organ, an organ which has no activity at all. It's like the appendicitis, it just happens to be there. It's a vestige organ. Nobody knows what's the function. 50 years ago, they discovered that it is a very important organ which defines our moods and controls our sleep and waking cycle. In medical terms, it's called the circadian rhythm. Sleeping, waking. One of the hormones that the pineal gland has is melatonin. When a little amount of melatonin is released into your bloodstream, then you feel very sleepy and comfortable. It's also indirectly responsible in the release of serotonin from the pituitary gland. Now all this, you know what is serotonin? The goodness factor. When you feel good and nice. Happiness is sometimes chemical, okay? So, what I'm trying to say is 50 years ago the pineal gland was considered to be a vestige organ. 60 years ago. 10 years later they said it's a very important organ which controls our life, our, our waking and sleep cycle. 100 years ago, Swami Vivekananda, perhaps the most prominent monk from India who went abroad and spoke, said that perhaps the pineal gland is a key point in man's, in human beings' connection with the higher senses. Hundred years ago, how did he know? And since the pineal gland controls the circadian rhythm or your sleep and waking cycle, we think we experience that the high spiritual state, which is known as Samadhi or Turiya, is very close to deep sleep. Unfortunately, you can't reach that through sleeping deeply. That's a different matter. The, the state is very similar to deep sleep. In Vedanta, deep sleep is called Shushupti. And next to that is the spiritual state called Turiya. There is a very thin borderline that separates Turiya and Shushupti. Unfortunately, as I said, you can't get there through deep sleep. Although many people who think they meditate go into deep sleep. That's a different matter. Because when the body relaxes, body and mind relaxes, if you can't go to a higher state, it shifts to deep sleep. Because sleep is also important to us. And why do we love sleep so much? Don't you find it difficult to wake up in the morning? Why do we love sleep so much? Because in sleep, you don't even know who you are or where you are. So you don't have problems. The problems for all of us start because I think I am so and so. People should respect me. In deep sleep, if somebody throws an egg at me, I don't know. I don't even know who I am. So when I don't know my identity, I'm very happy. Because if I, if I don't even realize that I exist, then you don't exist. Right? You may be my greatest enemy, but you don't exist because I don't exist. <laughs> Which is why sleep is so rejuvenating. 
because I don't know who I am, where I am, what is happening to me. I don't even know that I exist. So therefore the world doesn't exist, therefore there are no problems. I'm not saying that the solution is that we should sleep all the time. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to tell you why sleep is so rejuvenating. Now, if you remember, I think all of you have this experience. I do. When you're fast asleep and somebody wakes you up, you don't want to get up. You're half asleep. You're neither here nor there for some time. Very blissful. You want to go back to sleep. There is this interim period when you feel everything. It's so blissful. And when you wake up, you always remember that I had a blissful sleep, beautiful sleep. Right? Now, which means that even when you thought you didn't exist when you were asleep, there has been something watching. There has been something experiencing this wonderful feeling when nothing else matters. And therefore it remembers and says, oh, I had a blissful sleep. Although during the time you sleep, you don't remember it. So which I'm, or I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is when thoughts have become minimum and the mind has completely relaxed and is almost not there, there's just pure awareness, which we call mindfulness. Then there is great bliss and peace. Just like the state when you are neither sleeping nor waking up in between. But you are not conscious of it generally. Try to become conscious of it. There is no need of any complicated meditation techniques. But the moment you try to be conscious, you generally slip into sleep. Because your body and mind have not been trained. This whole training is what is called sadhana. So the blissful feeling the great happiness that one feels happens when one desire has ceased. I want something, I have found it. So for some time I am happy. Why? Because I am no more desiring for it. It's not because I have got it. It's a mind state. In deep sleep, I am not aware of my existence. Why so I am happy? In the state between sleep and waking, I remember that happiness when I didn't know who I am. And when I didn't know that I existed, therefore I am happy. There's one more. Well, Tantra misuses it, but it's not to be misused. It's just an example. In the height of sexual ecstasy, at the ultimate end of it, for some time there is no thought. You cannot think. Therefore it is so ecstatic. Yogis say without all this trouble, you can develop it quietly by yourselves. That state where everything is ceased except awareness. Sweet awareness. And it is the experience of all the great teachers in the spiritual field that one, once when one touches that, along with the peace and tranquility and happiness, there is some more, something else which becomes active. Compassion. It's not just a material factor. Why? Because then you realize that which you have touched is also in every living being. And therefore every living being is your own. There is no one different from you. So you love everybody. If you ask me, how can you live, uh, define love? We can't say. Even ordinary so-called material love, let us say. I don't like the division, but for practical purposes. When two young people are standing in the bus stop looking at each other, you go and ask them, what are you looking at? What are you feeling? They can't explain. They even made a Hindi movie, Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. Nobody knows what kya hota hai. <laughs> Something. If this is ordinary love, then what about that where everyone is one? <laughs> where you love everybody because in that state of complete tranquility and peace, there is nobody separate from you. It's all one. Someone even said when you are alone, it simply means all one.
So, we are saying that there are ways and means to go there. And the process of moving there does not involve either changing your robes or changing your station in life or running away to the cave. It can be done right here provided you are ready to invest 10 to 15 minutes every day in solitude. It can be your own room. You need not be a cave. In fact, if you meditate for many years in a cave and feel that you have become tranquil and quiet and so on, you will never get angry ever in your life. How do you know? My master, my teacher asked me this once. He said, you meditate for 13 years in the cave, okay, all alone. Huh? And then after 13 years you say, ah, now I am free of jealousy and anger and uh, all these things, I am free. So his question was, inside the cave, who are you angry with? The cave? And what are you jealous of? The walls of the cave? There's nothing. It's only when you come out of the cave and walk into a bus and somebody kicks you, especially if it is a stiletto heel. And then you know where you stand. So the only way to test your tranquility and peace is in the outside world. So there's no point in running away. However, in the early stages of spiritual progress, it is good to have short periods of solitude. It's like the, the silkworm, you know. Mm. What happens in the silkworm? There's a lowly worm walking on the mud. Then it decides to build a cocoon around itself. It's not going to stay forever in the cocoon. So you need the cocoon for a short while. And then it builds. And then it breaks open after some time when the worm has matured into a butterfly or a moth. And this same worm which was crawling around in the mud is now flying in the sky with beautiful wings. So that short period of cocoon was necessary, isolation, solitude. But forever you can't stay inside the cocoon, you have to come out. Unless you come out and you are with the world, you can't figure out where your mind has gone, what is its state at the moment. So, I here, I rest my case. I have a big jury here, so. Uh, if you have any questions regarding this, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes is a short time, I know that, but uh, there was a time when I could sit for hours and take questions and our life has become very busy even for me. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Now, this is a beautiful question. I personally believe that there is an all-pervading reality which is not conditioned by anything on this earth. I believe so. Uh, however, please understand that in the ancient Indian philosophy of Sankhya, for instance, or the Jains, or the Buddhists, there is no belief in God in brackets as presented in the Semitic gods. When I talk to the communist people, I always tell them, Karl Marx, when he talks of uh, religion, you know the Karl Marx's famous statement, religion is the opiate of the masses. I always say that if Karl Marx had read the Upanishads or the Buddhist texts, his idea of religion would have been different. When he talks about religion, he talks about the Semitic God who is supposed to be sitting there and controlling everybody like puppets with strings. 
which is also there, the concept of Ishvara. But beyond that, there is the concept of the essence of all life, which is there everywhere. There is no place where it is not there. And that, according to Vedanta, the highest of philosophies is called the Supreme Brahman, the Parabrahman. It's not God in the sense that it is, it has, it is some personality sitting there and doing things to us. I believe in such a being, such a reality. And it's also in you and it's in me. And it can be actually understood and realized. That way, yes, I believe in God. I, in modern times, I also believe in the other God, the big G. Because all information is stored, the Google God. <laughs>
because you are not studying it for exams. Education is a serious affair. It's growing from within. The understanding life, not just the subject. So I think dialogue is a very, very important thing and it should be encouraged in not argument and fighting with each other. That's not what I'm talking about. In fact, I went once to Bhutan to, uh, sorry, to Gangtok, to Sikkim, to one of the biggest Buddhist monasteries and uh, in Romtek. And I heard some sounds coming from behind, uh, from the Maidan. So I thought there was a wrestling match or something going on. So I went there and I found that these young monks are lined up and there is a teacher and they're having a discussion. And before somebody puts forth his point, he does this as if he's going to wrestle. You know, in India, traditionally, before you wrestle, you hit your thighs. So these guys first do so. That was the sound that I was hearing. And then it's as if, yeah, here, I have an answer. Now you discuss. There is no bad blood among the discussers. I think it's, a, it's an important point that dialogue should be encouraged. Now, in this matter, I have to also say that nobody really knows everything. Hmm? So we should give that leeway too when we ask a question. Uh, for instance, somewhere along the line, people think that a spiritual person should know everything. Not necessarily so. As long as you have a human brain, however advanced it is, it cannot be omnipresent, omniscient and omnipotent. Please understand this. Otherwise what happens, you give that idea, you consider somebody to be omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient. And then after some time, you find that he has some faults. Then the whole thing collapses. In the beginning itself, decide, no, he may be better than me, he may be a great being, but as a human being, he may have his imperfections. Absolutely. Yes. So, how do we find a way to get into this process of going? You are right, there are many ways, million ways, I would say. In fact, uh, I think as many number of human beings on this earth, so many number of parts to the truth. <laughs> So, we have to decide, first of all, for ourselves, what is more suitable. Suppose you are of a devotional nature, to whom devotion comes naturally. No need of argument, no need of discussion. You are a devotional minded man. For you, it would be better to approach this through devotion. Which means what? Prayer, meditation, music. Music is a great way of going with him. Hmm? Uh, I am always reminded of this, the Christian prayer in the Bible, which is called the Lord's Prayer. It's so simple. It doesn't say anything. It simply says, when thou prayest, go into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, play to the, pray to thy father in secret and you shall be rewarded openly. Now two things to remember, when you want to pray, don't show everybody that you are praying in public. Go into your closet, which means go into your little room. It also means go into your heart. Why? Because in another place, in the New Testament, lay treasures in your heart where thieves do not break in and steal. So that closet could refer to the heart, go in there and then spend some time there and what is the Lord's Prayer is very simple. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, thy will be done on this earth as it is. Give us, this is the main part, give us this day our daily bread, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, lead us not unto temptation but deliver us from evil. 
It's such a simple prayer, universal prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Nowadays we don't have to worry. You think, oh, I can go into the canteen. But please remember, it's possible that when you do, one day you go and it might be shut. Nobody knows. <laughs> it's not in our hands. So, that's one way. The other is, those who are contemplatives by nature, they should take up the practice of yoga, meditation and so on. And there are people who say, we are very intellectual, we cannot accept anything unless we have proved logically that it is so. Now, such people should take up what is called the study of Vedanta, which goes step by step into asking the question, who are you actually? Are you the person that you think you are? Or are you a product of society? Or are you multiple personalities trying to gather and become one in some way? When people tell me that somebody is schizophrenic, I tell them that we all human beings are schizophrenic in some way because we have, what is the meaning of schizophrenia? Split brain, right? It means you, you, you are sometimes one thing and sometimes the other. All of us are in some way. Sometimes you are monsters, sometimes you are good people. Already we are schizophrenic. The whole world is schizophrenic in a way. But when the symptoms become too much, then you say, oh, this fellow is not well. Uh, so we should prevent ourselves from getting to that state where we are put in behind bars. So we are. So try to integrate these personalities together into some source. For that, I would recommend for you being a young person, I would recommend that you start by reading the complete works of Swami Vivekananda to be a great help. First of all, they are not sectarian, they are completely open discussions, and they are beautiful, especially if possible read the section called Raj Yoga, where a discussion on Sankhya and Yoga has been very nicely in plain words given. And uh, if you can get hold of my autobiography, please do. I am not trying to sell my autobiography, but <laughs> so get hold of uh, complete works of Swami Vivekananda. Thank you so much sir for coming here. It was our immense pleasure and thanks a lot for giving us time. I would request our uh, friend Giovanni to uh, hand over a token to you. Um, so uh, in name of everyone, I would like to um, give this for you, which is our donation for your intervention. So I'd like to thank you for all, especially for the opportunity that you give us as exchange students because you show us another way to be a spiritual guru, which is sometimes is closer to our understanding. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.